voice of a bazillion, like I said, if you watched it, something animated in the past 15 years that had more than three characters, at least one of them was voiced by this young lady. Give it up for about me and how I got started, because usually people like to know that. And then I'm happy to open it up to questions from you guys and see what you want to hear about. So would you like to moderate, or should I just start talking about myself? Let's go back to the beginning. Um, you're you're uh, talking about your beginning in Kansas, and um, we'll take it from there. How's that? Uh, I, in fact, did grow up in Kansas. I lived in Kansas my entire life before I moved out to Los Angeles. And uh, people always say, well, how did you get started in voice acting? And I loved cartoons. When I was a, a little kid, I would watch cartoons, and, and I said, Mom, Dad, there's someone making the voices in these cartoons, and I want to do that one day. Technically, I said I want to be a Disney princess, but, you know. <laughs> Uh, don't we all? Don't we all? I drank the Kool-Aid very hard when I was a kid. I the Disney <laughs> Princess Kool-Aid. So, so I loved cartoons, and, and uh, I loved acting and singing and everything. So as I got older, I would, was doing singing performances in public, and I did a lot of theater, got a theater degree in, in college, and just kind of in the back of my mind, I always wanted to do the voiceovers along with that. So... I lived in Kansas City for just a little bit and did some professional theater and started auditioning for some radio ads and my I did some McDonald's spots, some voiceovers for McDonald's and I did something for a hospital and stuff like that. So eventually I moved to Los Angeles and at that time if you were an actor they would have these um, trade papers. So it would tell you about auditions that were coming up and uh, you know, we're looking for singers or we're looking for uh, actors. And there was an ad for voice talent for an animation project, an untitled animation project. So I was like, oh my gosh, yes. So I went and I showed up and uh, I did a little audition and they said, we want you to come back and we're going to send you home with a VHS tape. That's, woo! For those that don't know what that is, it's something that you watch movies on. Uh, I'm sorry, I have a Betamax at home. Do you have a real to real? So they sent me home with this tape, and they said, You're not going to understand what's going on. It's all in Japanese. Don't worry about it. Just take a look at this one character and see if you can kind of capture the tone and energy of, of what she's doing. And so I watched it, and I had no idea what was going on, but I'm like, Okay, you know. She's like, <laughs> And I'm like, I don't know what's going on, but this seems to be the energy of the character. So I went back and did another audition. And they said, have you ever had any experience dubbing before? And I was like, I have no idea what that is, but I, I swear to you, I will learn, and I learn fast. So they offered me the role, and it ended up being Haruko in FLCO. And that was my very first animation job. Uh, and then from there, I started doing a number of other anime projects. And then I started booking some work in some video games. And uh, then I started booking work in, in US cartoons. Uh, and they haven't kicked me out of town yet. So I'm, I'm still doing it, doing it to this day. <laughs> so I'll ask, some, I'll ask something that uh, I'm interested in. And then we'll open it up to a question like there. Um, you, uh, the, uh, Bunched, you bounced into uh, something about the Super Monkey Team Hyperforce Go. Ah, yes. Just because that title is just, you can say it all day long. It's, in fact, there's, you're missing a word. It's Super <coughs> Robot Monkey, Robot Monkey. Okay, my Hyperforce bad. Go. And yeah. it's so sad because my dad, my sweet Kansas father, it took him like, we did, I think, 52 episodes of that show. And by episode 52, he had finally learned how to say the name correctly, and then the show got canceled, so. <laughs> uh. But he kept trying. It was adorable. 
And by the time he finally got it, the show ended, so. Yeah. Ah, salami. So, who wants to open up? Anyone, anyone, anyone? Yes, sir, the elevator back. Uh, how is it working with uh, the show Rick and Morty? Oh, yes. Rick and Morty is great. Um, in answer to your burning question, I have no idea when season three is going to start airing. <laughs> As there's a collective, oh, <laughs> in the audience. Yeah, I wish I knew. No one knows. Uh, but it's pretty great. Justin Roiland, the creator of the show, and I, we worked on a Disney show called Fish Hooks together. And I was Chelsea. Girl. And it was a very fun show. And... He and I met a few times during that, and then he ended up having this cartoon that he was putting together, and they did an audition for it, and he cast me as as Jessica. And then it was really cool, because he, he just started bringing me in for Alien Number 2, or, uh, you know, the old woman in the bar number one, or, uh, and then I started doing the voice of Rick's spaceship, so anytime you hear the keep summer safe, that's me. Uh, so it's kind of like a little Where's Waldo of, of Kari on Rick and Morty. So, and I owe that to Justin. It's very cool. Uh, working with the industry, you've met uh, many uh, voice talents. Who's your favorite voice actor? Oh, that's a good question. So the question is, who is my favorite voice actor that I've met and why? And there are two. There are two. The first one is Tom Kenny, the voice of SpongeBob. Oh, yeah. And the great thing about Tom, well, here's a little weird piece of trivia for you guys. Tom and I share the same birthday, July 13th. So every year, SpongeBob and I are like, happy birthday, happy birthday. Uh, and he is just the kindest, most energetic man you will ever meet. Like, his brain never turns off. And he's so talented. Robot Monkeys and Hyper Frisco, uh, which was my first U.S. series. And kind of the cool thing about that show was it was heavily influenced by anime. So even though it was a U.S. show, the creator of it, stylistically and artistically, all of it was drawn from a lot of anime. Uh, serendipitous project to be my first U.S. show. So, so Tom was on that, and he he just kind of taught me a lot. It was really great to be able to watch him and work with him in the booth because we all recorded together. Um, the other one is Dee Bradley Baker, and he does every creature voice known to man. If if it's not Frank Welker, it's Dee Bradley Baker doing all of the animal noises, dragon noises, ogre noises. Like, it's, D is in everything. Like, he's got a thousand credits, no joke. Um, and D's another one that just, he's given me so much great advice over the years. And not only is he insanely talented, but he's very kind and lovely to work with. And he's also kind of just given me some, some great career advice as I've gone on my journey. Yeah. What's the difference between the two? Great question. Um, so, so basically, we record animation or video games in one of two ways. Uh, if we're doing anime or uh, sometimes a video game that's that's coming directly from being released in Japan or something like that. The picture already exists for us. We see the character on the screen. We're in, we're in a booth and there's a TV screen right there. And we see the character, we see the artwork, we see the facial expressions of the characters. We hear the beautiful musical score. Everything's painted for you. And we have to sync up every single line to what already exists there. So you usually hear three beeps in your headphones. You, you record by yourself. So I'm just alone in a studio with a TV screen. And then there in the other room is the director and the engineer. And you'll hear boop, boop, boop. 
and then you start talking. And you'll see on the screen, and it's my job to look at the script and put in, I've never loved anyone as much as you. So, the difference is, when we record something like Rick and Morty or Phineas and Ferb, what we would call like original animation, it's the exact opposite. We record the voices first and then they animate to us. Uh, so if I have the same line, I've never loved anyone as much as you. Like, I have the freedom to interpret it that way. I can, I can say that line however I want and however the director directs me to do it because later they will ship that off and someone somewhere will animate the cartoon to my voice. The other great thing about that scenario is that a lot of times we get to record together as a cast and that's really fun. You get a, it's, it can get a little crazy too because that's a lot of creative personalities in one room but we're all sitting there kind of in a half circle and just recording together and bouncing off of each other's energy and that can make it a lot of fun. So it's just the recording process that's very, uh, very different. Um, how long did it take for you to record all your lines for Proctum, Ingram, and Fallout 4? Because I can imagine, for like, for the people that played the male and female, well, well I can imagine that must have taken years to do that because of how oh, much gosh. dialogue they had. That is a good question. Um, for Proctor Ingram, it actually probably only took maybe eight hours or something altogether. Um, with video games, video games can be very uh, uh, labor intensive. So sometimes we'll get a script for a video game and you have 40,000 lines. So you just keep going into the studio for like two hours at a time or four hours at a time and recording line after line after line. So that particular character didn't take a ton of time, but uh, I think maybe the longest one I ever did was, was the Prince of Persia game with Elika in it. And that one, not only did I have like, I might have had 80,000 lines and a lot of them were in Farsi. So I was having to learn how to phonetically say all of the Farsi correctly, uh, and then uh, also That's a tricky tongue, too. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. very tricky. And the other thing about video games that I don't know if you guys know this or not, but every grunt or scream or gasp that you guys hear in the infighting parts of the game, we record every Script that may be 10 pages of small reaction, medium reaction, long reaction, small punch sound, medium punch sound. So what that means as a voice actor is that you start doing this. or however long it is. And what's really great is when it gets creative and you're being strangled by piano wire. <laughs> you're being electrocuted by an electric fence. You have just consumed poison. My favorite one was you've been fed into a wood chipper. Wow. <laughs> Honest to goodness. There's actually a video out there on the internet. Of somebody asked me to, to do it at a convention years ago, and it's me reenacting being fed into a wood chipper. <laughs> Go how, and search. How long did it take was that? Was that a quick, Bzzah! or was it like the, oh, no, no, I mean. Well, that is the first question you have to ask yourself. What's your, what would you think your first question would be if you, if you see being fed into a wood chipper? You're on the right track. Is it the earth? Yeah. <laughs> right? Because that's going to change things a lot if you're being, I can't see what we're talking about, this is good. <laughs> Sunday morning. Sunday morning. But yeah, so it's a very different thing if you're being fed in feet first than if you're being fed into a witch or head first. The more you know. <laughs> 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 
Um, you're going to, uh, you've done a lot of work uh, for Time Warner, uh, the DC, uh, most of the Scooby Doo stuff. You've been done, you're been dabbling a lot in Starfire and uh, Young Justice, uh, Carol Ferris. One episode. One episode, but Young Justice is coming back. Yeah. And Carol Ferris, of course, does eventually become a supervillainess. Yeah, I was really sad about that one because I came in for that episode and they're like, next season we've got this whole story arc for her, and then the show got canceled. I was like, no! But it, it is happened. coming back. It is coming back. I, I, you know, and maybe you're allowed to talk about it, maybe not, but... Uh, no, it's uh, sad to say I am not in it as of this point. So. Okay. So. Well, they're still, they're still writing. So. Yes. I, I'm, Come on, guys, make it happen. Happen, well, we made it happen, you know, with the, the Netflix going back and everything else, and it would shock me because it's been so long. Right. It was a grassroots thing with you had to be like so immediate to say something, and I was like, wait, they're bringing it. a friend of mine writes the show, and we're bringing it back, get out. So. It's pretty amazing. The, it's the power of the fans, you know. Have you ever doubted that? Like, uh, follow like the graphic novels of characters that I've played or do I do I follow like news reports that this is what's happening with this character and more like like um, how the fan art um, and actual the actual like fandom and like the little side things that um, fans will come up with do you follow those at all a little bit I love fan art I absolutely love fan art so whenever <laughs> I, I run across it and you know, it's either a character that I really like. I'm a huge Wonder Woman fanatic, so I, I collect a bunch of Wonder Woman. You know, cool artwork of her or a new figurine that's out and stuff like that. I'm always, you know, keeping checked into that. But if if fans do artwork of the character that I've played or, or something like this, I love finding that stuff. Tag me if any of you guys are artists. I, I always love to see it. So... Fan fiction, not as much. Not so much. <laughs> that gets to be a slippery slope. That's a good way of putting it. Even just saying yeah. slippery slope makes me feel a little bad in conjunction with fan fiction. So, uh, yeah, that, that's kind of a little outside of my, my realm. Good one, though. Yeah. <laughs> Which one do you like doing more? Do you like doing video games more or anime more? Or, like you said, original, like, American cartoons? Um... They're, they're all fun in different ways, and I, I really like the fact that I get to do all three, knock on, on lots of wood. Um, I mean, if I had to be hard-pressed to pick one, maybe the original animation, just because you have so much freedom. Um, uh, you know, with, with video games or with anime, so much of that is a technical skill as well as an artistic skill. Even if you're building a video game from the ground up, you know, there's timing issues. This has to be faster, this has to be clearer, this has to fit within a certain uh, section of the game. Uh, and with original animation, sometimes you just make the most random choices or you or you just go out on a limb and you, you do something that's crazy and they, they actually keep it. Um, I'm, I'm doing this show right now that's been really, really fun called Bunsen is a Beast on Nickelodeon. It just started airing like in the last month or so. And I play this character named Amanda Kilman, and she's the villain of the show. She, she's got these braces and she talks with a lisp and she's like really evil. And there was an episode a couple weeks ago where I was just kind of watching to see how it turned out. And she has a line where she says, and now it is time to sabotage my enemies. And I read it like that, and I was like, there's no way they're going to let me get away with sabotage. There's, there's no way. So I gave it to them one time, Shatner-ish, and then one time, more straightforward, and they kept the other one. They kept the sabotage. And I, I was watching, and I almost, like, teared up a little bit. I'm like, ooh, the greatest moment of artistic freedom ever, you know? So it was great. They just, they are like, we love it. We're keeping it. And a lot of times you don't have that freedom in in a couple of the other realms. Yeah. Uh, most obscure role, like previous um, times we've only seen 
most obscure. That's a hard one because I've done some obscure stuff. <laughs> I'm I'm the queen of woman number two and old lady in the store or young boy on bike. <laughs> like those are those are the roles that I will get in a in a TV show. So strumpet on the street and killing joke. Right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I was a total call girl in the killing joke and stuff. But I had more lines. The call girl actually talked a little bit more in that one. Than yeah, that's true. Yeah. So yeah, it's just lots of random stuff. Can we talk about Paperman? Because it won an Academy Award. It did. Uh, it was remember that Paper Man was the short in uh, a couple of years, but Disney started doing the, the, the little shorts, and yeah. uh, they started experimenting with that again, which is great. So it harkens back to the old time. How'd, how'd that come about? Uh, that was a pretty cool experience. I had worked for them before for Disney on some other things, and so when they decided they just wanted like a little ambient voice work for the girl, Meg, in Paper Man. They called me in. I didn't even audition for that one, which was kind of lovely. Um, and so, Happy New Year's Eve? Is that uh, okay, that? Okay. Okay. <laughs> a little early. Uh, <laughs> but, so I went in and the session was not very long at all because they're like, we're not even sure how much of this we're going to use, but we just want little uh, laughs and we want her to have a little snort here at this second. And there's going to be a couple of breaths here and there. So it was just tiny little stuff, and I, they, I think they literally used like two things in the, in the short. Uh, but they showed it to me first, and I pride myself on being kind of professional, but they showed it to me with the music. And I was bawling by the end. And I was like, I'm so sorry you guys, I just don't usually do this, but this is really beautiful, and I can't help but cry a little bit. And the director goes, this was a chip flick. I knew it. <laughs> it was. It was really awesome. But I was so embarrassed. But it was so lovely and powerful. And and then when that went on to to win the Oscar, it was just like, wow. I can now say that I'm my gas or my snort is Oscar winning. <laughs> I heard a, a rumor that there was a somebody in old timey Hollywood that he would actually win a bunch of Oscars and he would actually ship away and would give people like little slivers that he thought it's like you you deserve oh, a piece that's of this you deserve a piece of that. yeah i would just i would deserve like a nostril just <laughs> one oscar nostril <laughs> they could just chip that off it's like ding, there you go thank, thank you uh, thanks much us who's got another one? Oh yeah um so you worked on gravity falls i did work on gravity falls yes i'm chandra jimenez a real reporter and I just ate a rat for dinner. <laughs> it's, it's great. I mean, I wish it would have gone longer. Everybody wishes it would have gone longer, but uh, I really admire Alex Hirsch that created the show. And he, he would do the directing, he would do, you know, he just had his hand in every part of the process of putting that show together. So he was a real mastermind, in my opinion. Uh, I didn't get to record with the cast. Unfortunately, I would record by myself and do lots of little roles in the show and stuff. But uh, he had a very clear vision of where he wanted that show to go and, and uh, what story he wanted to tell. And it's pretty cool. He made it, made it happen. So we are just all sad that it did not go much, much longer. I love it. Your friend is consoling you, so I'm guessing maybe you feel the same way. Sister. Oh my gosh, I love it. Do you guys go to a lot of conventions together? It's awesome. Now, twins, younger, older? Okay. Just had to ask. I love it. I'm embarrassed you guys. Sorry. No, that's okay. If you could reboot any of your previous projects that you felt might have cut out too soon. <laughs> you had, Here's the monkey's paw. You could bring back one of your shows. Maybe Super Robot Monkey Team, Hyperforce Go. Uh, yeah, I feel like, because I still have very passionate fans of that show sending artwork or you know doing drawings and, and bringing them to conventions and things like that. And I, I just, they were trying to kind of launch this new network with Disney. And, and so I just never felt like it quite got the audience that it could have. 
And your character was the butt kicker on that show. Of course. Uh. <laughs> the yellow monkey. No butt. Yellow monkey. All the way in the back. Pink hair. great question. The question is, do I do anything specific to get into character? Um, it depends on the show. Like some, sometimes I'll dress a little bit like what I'm going to do. Like if I'm going to do a little boy voice, I usually try not to wear a sundress that day. <laughs> I mean, I know it sounds weird, but like it, it taps into something a little bit more boy for me if I'm wearing jeans and a t-shirt. Uh, and I sing in the car and there is a video again out on the internet um, my friend was like you just have to record yourself doing this because you know this actually is what you do and I love warming up to Marilyn Manson <laughs> I've seen that and so there is this video on the internet of me singing in my car in this little girl voice that I was doing. It's like, you know, it's like, you want to be like this kind of character and singing a Manson song. And people are like, you don't really do Yeah. That would be my go-to song. It's my go-to song every time. So, enjoy. <laughs> What's that? That was Chloe's voice. Yes, in Fairly Odd Parents. I, I, um, I, growing up, growing up, I used to, um, thought she was annoying, but... And now you like her? <laughs> That's another thing I will tell you guys that you can never please everyone. Like fans have passionately loved and passionately hated things that I have done, and it you do the best that you can, especially if it's based on other source material. You you know you you work collaboratively with everyone that's in the room, and you try to do your best. But <coughs> people sometimes like it, and sometimes they don't. I think you had a pretty good average. Thanks. <laughs> um, let's talk a little Kung Fu Panda. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how that how that evolved for you? Because that was a. Because uh, that was a that was a weird thing for DreamWorks. Because they were they were trying to get away from Shrek, and they're they're really right. they were tr they're trying to find the next Shrek without it looking like Shrek. Right. Um, that was that was a pretty cool process. It, I did the TV series Kung Fu Panda Legends of Awesomeness, and then I did. Uh, I did Tigress in that show, and then I did Tigress in a couple of the video games, and then they did a Secrets of the Scroll, Scrolls short movie, and I did Tigress in that one. Basically anything that was too cheap for Angelina Jolie, I did. So, <laughs> um, but it's great. It was, it was interesting with that one because, uh, you know, it's it's... They gave me a little bit more room to play with that character than I thought that they would because and the other gal was more of a dead-on Angelina Jolie voice match, and I was apparently slightly funnier. So they're like, we, we just want to kind of see what you do with it. So they cast me in the role, and I've been very lucky to, to get to do it in a number of projects since then. So. I know, and then on the flip side, uh, you dabbled a little bit in Star Wars with Clone Wars. Mm -hmm. I did. I was Leta Tormond in the, in the Clone Wars for a couple of episodes, and uh, I've also done a number of the video games and Star Wars things here and there. The, the Star Wars family. So in the universe. So we were here at Diana for uh, anyway, uh, Little Hat again. I was wondering how you deal with rejection. Like when you when you don't get the part, how do you stay <clears throat> chipper? And... That is a great question. That is a really, really good question because rejection happens constantly. Um, literally, if you are very, very successful, and this is very successful in voiceover, you may get one job out of 50. So what I like to do is just kind of Jedi mind wipe myself <laughs> after most auditions. You just sort of put it out there and uh, kind of forget about it. Um, because the ones that have hurt the most are the ones that you're like, oh, I'd really like to get that one. And then you think about it and you think about it and eventually, you know, it just, you don't ever hear anything. And then it comes out on the air and you're like, well, someone else obviously got that. But, but it's, such a, it's such a part of the business 
that you, you have to find some way to sort of not tie your self-worth to it. And it's the same, same way with like fan feedback on the characters that you do. You just have to find some way to sort of separate um, what it is that makes you a, a good human being and what it is that you do for a living. And it can be hard sometimes, and the rejection can feel very personal sometimes, but it's not. Uh, it's like Vegas, you just keep playing the, you know, playing the odds and, and uh, shooting craps on the table until you, one of those craps fertilizes something and it grows. I don't know. <laughs> That's terrible. That's a terrible analogy. I apologize. We get it. Okay, you, you and then you and then you're there, so take it away. So I know there are some ways that you have a character that they, they seem to resonate with. Is there any character that you've done in particular that you feel a particular resonation with? Uh, that's a great question. The question was, are there are there any characters that I felt really resonated with me? Um, there have been a few. Uh, I always like the characters that there's this tiny part of me that's just like, if I were unfiltered and not caring about being nice to anyone, like my kid. So for instance, like if I get Andy Kilman and in Bunts and His Beast, and I think, that's my id. If I were just, if I could just pursue a course of evil and destruction in the world, that's what that would be. <laughs> <laughs> if I could just pursue the, the sexier side of me that I, that I don't you know, show in public, that might be Aranea in Final Fantasy XV. You know, you just get to tap into these little parts of yourself that you don't show on a daily basis. So, yeah, there's there's definitely been a number of characters over the years that I've resonated with. Cool. And uh, Redshirt, yeah. Uh, my question was actually the exact opposite of this. Mine was, uh, have you ever played any characters that you just could not sign any type of connection with? Oh my gosh, were any of you here at the panel yesterday? Yep. Anybody? Yeah. Okay, so some of you are going to hear this, this story again, but I cannot name the name of the show. Sorry. But there was a character that I hated so much. She was dumb, and did I mention she was stupid? And she just needed a man to help her figure out how to open a doorknob. And she, did I mention she was stupid? <laughs> Like, I, everything about this character, I absolutely despised. And, but a couple of really great things came out of that experience. First of all, uh, I became very good friends with the director, and we kind of bonded over our mutual hatred of the show. So, this is so many years later, and now we are still best of friends. So, that came out of that experience. And the also thing that, the other thing that came out of that experience is, I don't have to say yes to everything. And so there have been parts since then that I have turned down because I absolutely did not find anything redeeming personally about a character that I was uh, given an audition for. So that was a very good lesson, that sometimes you can pass on things that just do not sit well with your, your gut and your soul. Right on, right on. Uh, there was uh, somebody that... Yeah, yeah, it was you. Yes, right. Um, is there any projects that you would like to be attached to that you're currently not? Uh, I mentioned this the other day, too. Do you think Superhero Girls is, is such a, a cute, you know, girl power series? And I haven't had a chance to do anything on that. So that would have been kind of nice. Uh, but I, I'm also a big believer in that the parts that you're meant to get, you kind of get. So Robot Chicken, Elite. I, I, I would have liked to have done a little Robot Chicken. You can have my question if you want. Uh, I know that they're in talks to do it, and the rumor is that it is happening, but I have not been asked to reprise my role yet, so I'm keeping my fingers crossed. That's, that's one, sentimentally, that I'd really like to come back for. And um, he wanted to ask oh, you a question. Yeah, Nightwing and then you.
Um, uh, for, um, first of all, Patty, uh, uh, um, apologies for the lack of originality of this question because I asked it last year too. Dude, um, uh, I wasn't here. This will be yeah, news for me. Yeah, yeah. Later yeah. um, uh, on. Um, you got you got any hilarious um, uh, booth stories to share? I do. They're children. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually going to ask this question. Children out. I could, I know the very generic answer to this story is that engineers in the recording studio, you should always be nice to them. Always be nice to your engineers because they record everything. In between takes, that's why all those 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 leaked things get out there about celebrities being jerks in the in the booth, that's because they were mean to their engineer. Every summer, peas grow there. Right? Exactly. <laughs> the Orson Welles Frozen Bees commercial, if you ever it's, find that online and deal with jaw drop. It's horrifying and amazing. So, luckily, I mean, the engineers that I work with, usually I have a pretty good relationship with, but there was one time where I said something that sounded very dirty, even though it wasn't meant to be dirty and they recorded it and so for every time that I came in like the next six sessions they would play it over and over in my headphones <laughs> yeah so, so be nice uh, to your engineers good. okay bring us home um, has there ever been like, let's say you would record something you messed up so hard, like it would be it was such a hilarious blooper that really stuck out to you? Oh gosh, I've messed up a lot of things over the years, so there are there are definitely blooper reels out there. Uh, I, I I think those moments where my co-stars will make me laugh so hard that I can't breathe too. There will just be times where I can't get it together. And it doesn't happen very often, but sometimes I will, somebody will crack me up so hard that literally will just blow about six or seven takes of me laughing through the line. So like, do it again, Kari. And I'm like, no, no, okay. I'm serious. You know, and it just it doesn't work. So. Cool. And with that, unfortunately, uh, that is the end of our time. Uh, where, uh, what social media outlets can uh, people follow you on? I love hearing from people on social media, so you can follow me at Twitter uh, at Kari Walgren. Uh, I'm on Instagram at Kari underscore Walgren, and it's all lowercase letters because something wonky happened with trying to get my name just as is. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and then I've got a Facebook official fan page if you want more videos and content and stuff like that. So, uh, so please join the party online. Uh, and I'm going to be signing, this is my last, obviously, last day. It's our last day for all of us. Yeah. Uh, but I'm going to be signing, uh, until about 4.30 today. Okay. So feel free to come down and visit me and lots of pictures and scribbles and you have a question you wanted to wanted to ask and or you remember one between now and then by all means. Yeah. Please a round of applause for our lovely Thank guest. I'll be back at uh, two o'clock with uh, Power Ranger Steve Cardenas.